it's so nice to see everyone again virtually. You're on Music and Chat with Shelly Ong and it's a good evening from me to you from Nashville, Tennessee. Please say hi in the live chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. Don't be backward and coming forward. Remember to put any questions you may have in the live chat so that I may address them as the stream moves along. There is a lag from when I broadcast to when you receive it. So I have finally settled back into life in the States. Uh, the plane flight was surprisingly smooth considering all the required pre-flight preparation and the fear mongering from different sources. I am doing well. I did my 14 day stay home whilst getting over jet lag, but my circadian rhythm and I were not good dance partners. But again, I'm doing well. It is 7 p.m. Central Time. It's 8 a.m. tomorrow in Singapore. 10 a.m. in Australia. I hope my Australian friends are here as well. So let's get on with the stream. So who's here today? Please say hi in the live chat. I'm looking at the chat column. You can see it to the right of the stream. Please let us know who you are and where you're tuning in from. So, um, it is so nice to be back in a state and to be able to be on the same time zone as most as my friends. So, uh, I know most of you want to hear me play something. It is still early in the evening, but I will play you a piece from my fourth album called a working title and the piece is an instrumental uh, and it is known as a working title da capo and it's an extended version so here we go let me turn on my theremin cam so you get to see me playing theremin because that's what i'm gonna play Ooh.
So that was a working title da capo, the extended version from my fourth album, a working title special edition. And if you're interested in hearing the other songs from it, instrumental and sung songs, both, and I play theremin, synthesizers, uh, do my sound design, and so on and so forth. You can find them on my Bandcamp store, shirleyong.bandcamp.com. And you can see how to spell my name right below to your left hand corner at the bottom. So I see some virtual bodies here online. I know how many of you are here and I know some of you are hiding. Don't hide. Please tell us where you're coming, tuning in from because we like to know so that we can chat with you. And if there are some questions that we have that we can't answer, we ask you. That's why it's a live stream. Oh. Who wants to be the first? I'll be the first. Hello, I'm typing in the live chat. My name is Shelly and I'm tuning in from Na oops. Nashville, Tennessee. There you go. Who wants to follow me? Okay. So um, I'm really excited about our guest today and he is my first guest for season two because the month of October is a month about instrument design, the science behind instrument design and the future of instrument design. Oh, hi Mix, my good friend Michael Spicer. Have you got your coffee in hand? I hope so. I got my tea though. <laughs> Thanks for chiming in. Who's next? So as I was saying, um, yes, uh, our guest today, Trevor Pinch. <laughs> uh, many of you know him as uh, the author of Analog Days. In fact, I think most of my friends know him personally. He's a great chap. Uh, and uh, he asked me during our quick test before my live stream went on, he said, do I have to be very serious or can I uh, mess about? And of course, my answer was mess about. Those weren't his words, but that's my summary. So, but he wrote the book, uh, Analog Days, and he's also the co-conspirator of the 1984 paper on the social construction of technology. It was written with Weber Biker, the professor of social science and technology in the Netherlands. So what is the social construction of technology? Scott for short. So I'm going to refer to it as Scott. Well, social constructivists believe that human action is the catalyst for new technology. Yes. Do you feel very important now? Like, yes, <laughs> you should. So without further ado, let us welcome Trevor Pinch. I am going to Skype him right now. Hey, hi, Shirley. Hey. <laughs> hey, Trevor. Okay? Huh? Can you hear me okay? Yes, I am going to turn you up slightly for my own benefit so I can hear every word that you say. But I'm also going to adjust you in the frame so that you fit. Hey, Shirley, I saw your song on that. Your, you know, I was watching on my iPhone. Uh -huh. and you should be doing Stranger Things with the Thurman. That's the perfect <laughs> introduction. You get that gig. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I have to remember to do that. Thanks. See, yeah. I need I need my friends who know me well to give me good suggestions. 
I know it's it's really cool for science fiction as always the Thurman. And uh-huh. that particular thing I thought was nice. Yeah, it's a good idea. You know, Trevor, I try very hard to play other kinds of music so that people don't continue to pigeonhole a the theremin and the sci-fi stuff only. But you know. oh god, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah you're no. the Carl more really. Yeah. No, it's don't be sorry. Cool. <clears throat> yeah. So so um. Shall we tell the story of how we met? Are we allowed to do that or is this going to be? Yes, that was my question. I wanted to know how you and Professor Biker came up with that theory that from what I understand that groups or individuals decide what is useful technology and what is deemed useful depends on the type of group involved. Yeah, right. That's weird. This is the social construction of technology. Mm-hmm. Right. And um this guy, Viva Baker, is a really cool guy because he studies the bike. His name is Baker, B-I-J-K-E-R. And he studies the bicycle, the history of the bicycle. I was at a conference oh, yeah. in Austria and I'd been studying, my background was in physics. Mm-hmm. And I've been developing this theory of social construction in the area of physics, actually. I had my own little center called the social construction of the sun because I was doing oh. solar physics. I was studying things to do with the physics of the sun. Oh. And he was studying the bicycle and he was presenting a paper at a meeting called the social construction of the bicycle. I was doing this thing called the social construction of the sun. So we thought, why don't we work together? And we did. We worked together and we came up with this whole new approach called social construction of technology, Scott, which I guess is what you want to hear about. And yeah. actually, some of the ideas behind that are in my book, Analog Days, on the, the synthesizer. So we can, you know, the history of Bob Mogan, the synthesizer and the struggle between the East Coast synthesizer designs of Bob Moog and the West Coast of Don Buchla is actually a good illustration also of social construction. But the case study, we, we, we did a case study, we developed this theory, and um, as you say, it was back in the 19, 1984, I think. And our main case study was the development of the bicycle from about the period of about 1890 to 1900, where the bicycle went from what we call in England, the penny farthing. You remember these bikes with this huge front wheel and a tiny little back wheel? Mm-hmm. Um, to what became the standard bike called the safety bicycle, which is basically the bicycle we've had today. The history of bicycle history has been very stable, apart from things like mountain bikes, which have disrupted it. But mm-hmm. the safety bike is basically the bicycle that most people ride. It's got two wheels, it's got a chain drive, it's got um, pneumatic tires and you sit over the back wheel. And we studied that transition. And mm-hmm. so here's the idea of the social construction of technology. We, we were interested in the different meanings given to technology mm-hmm. by ordinary people, people who buy technology, use technology, people who make technology, people who market technology. Mm-hmm. And we said they have a kind of shared meaning of a technology, an idea of a technology that's shared amongst them, because mm-hmm. we were sociologists. and. Um, that high wheel bike had a meaning for people who wanted to ride it for transport. It was the unsafe bike because that bike was very dangerous. Um, you'd go over, it was called doing a header. Remember roads weren't paved back in 1890. Yeah. You'd show off, young men would show off in parks on these bikes. And the development was actually the wheels got bigger and bigger. It was kind of a sporty show off macho bike. Older people who wanted them saw this as a thing for transport. Women had problems because of Victorian ethos. You weren't supposed to even be riding a bicycle, mm. especially one where you could climb up high so people, good God, could look up your skirts. <laughs> so, so it offended the Victorian morals at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was these two bikes. There was kind of the macho bike and the unsafe bike, and different groups of people had different meanings of the bike. For some people, the meaning was the unsafe bike. Mm. For others, it was the macho bike. We call that, we have a technical term, but you don't need to worry what it's called. It's called interpretive flexibility. In other words, there's contested meaning. And our idea was you could trace the history of technology through fights between these contested meanings. The engineers are responding to the meaning, and eventually a predominant meaning wins out then the, the artifact, the piece of technology becomes fairly stable for many years. And the, and the meaning that won out was that, in fact, that people wanted a safe bike. And even the very name, the safety bicycle. Mm-hmm. For women, it was actually called 
the freedom bicycle that was the name they gave to it because they could suddenly get on this bike and ride everywhere and so we developed that theory around th that period for the bicycle now most sociology of technology what was so interesting and new about this for us anyway we found it interesting and the world did but we did um was most sociology of technology looks at the impact of technology on society um for instance here's a good example i use in class um, I'm teaching at Cornell University, and there's a little company in town that developed something called the Silent Disco. Now, the Silent Disco, you may be familiar with it, is where you see people on the dance floor with big headphones Oh, on. yes, I have. Yeah, you, you know, and it's Wi-Fi'd in or Bluetoothed in. Yeah. Um, and um, you can have more than one track playing. Yeah. There's no sound in the room. It's really weird to watch. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you just hear their feet moving, and they'll all be doing completely different dances. Mm -hmm. And um, you can have you know two or three different tracks playing, and you can choose which one you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so there's an example. Think of society, the society of dancers, and how technology impacts them. Here's a new technology, mm -hmm. you know, the silent disco technology, mm -hmm. and it changes how people dance because you now have different styles of dancing at the mm -hmm. same time. It changes interaction on the dance floor. Because when I was a young lad, we used to go occasionally go to dances. The Friday night dance in England was where you met people and you sort of pluck up your courage and you sort of be bopping away dancing and you say, "Ooh, I'm from Muswell Hill. Where are you from?" And "Ooh, you know, have you got a? I've got a degree of you or whatever your channel <laughs> life was." And now, of course, with um, headphones, no one can say anything, and so um, it, it changes, disrupts society. So. It's the impact of technology on society. It's kind of fairly easy to study. Um, it's well known, you know, the impact of computers on society, the so impact have, of Google. So I have a so, couple of questions as you are, yeah, yeah. you know, expounding on the theory. No, you're good. Uh, the first one is, wouldn't you say that we are all exercises of interpretive flexibility, though? I can't imagine anyone who is not one of those. Well, we're, we're all we're all humans. We're all participating in, in society and we all use technology. And by the way, I should just add this. It's rather obvious, I think, for the sorts of technologies I'm not I'm talking about. I'm not talking about technology like the media talks about it, where they just mean iPhones or I understand. You know, your computers. We're talking mm -hmm. about things that Tools. enable humans, machines and artifacts like like, um, you know, it can be trains or boats or yeah. bicycles or. You know, all sorts of things can be technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so we all share meanings of technology and the meaning gets built into the artifact mm -hmm. and those meanings can be contested. Mm -hmm. So here's a good example from our own field, you know, synthesizers. Mm -hmm. the, the meaning of the bukla has a different meaning to the meaning of the moog. The moog is, you know, Don Bukla famously rejected having keyboards on his instruments. He had these wands, you know, uh, thunder and lightning or various mm -hmm. plates you could press. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob had the 12 notes of the chromatic scale mm -hmm. um, as an option. He had other things as well, the ribbon control on his modular. But when it became the mini mo, it became a built-in keyboard. So the meaning of the synthesizer is increasingly about a particular cultural assumption about music. The music is the 12 notes of the chromatic scale that kind of hardwired into the piece of technology. Well, for book class, if you're into the book class synthesizer, it's a completely different meaning. It's much more experimental, avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Although with the Moog, you can do wild things. And with the book, you can actually, it's very difficult, but you can tune it to a chromatic scale. But it's not meant to be that way. The way it usually is used is not like that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but here's a good example of how, and people share those meanings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, because it's embedded in the artifact, you can't suddenly take a Moog and do the wildest things possible. Most people will, you know, the designer synthesizers have become MIDI keyboards. Most people will want to play 12 note chromatic scale pieces on them with added effects. Um, though in theory, you can do other sorts of things. So that sort of sharing of a meaning mm. in practices as well is what we call the, how the meaning of a technology gets embedded into a society. Mm -hmm. And so what's different about social construction technology, going back to the the silent disco, that's the impact of technology on society. Mm -hmm. Our theory is about how society 
impacts technology or shapes technology, how it goes the other way. Which is why, so, my, uh, which is why my question, I was wondering if you would regard uh, the human race, or well, maybe you know, the animal kingdom might also participate in this notion that we all do practice interpretive flexi flexibility. We all have the ability to look at a tool or some, you know, a, a, a notion of sorts and say, well, I do see multiple uses of that or multiple meanings of that. Uh, and um, I'm amongst, you know, uh, my mom and her friends a lot, and uh, or had been, while mm. I was in Singapore, and I noticed that they were very resourceful. They would have one item, and they see different uses for it. So I was just curious, you know, uh, if we put aside computers and anything that seemed to be, to be the glossy type of technology, and we bring it back down to the simple things, whether you could say that we all do interpret in a flex absolutely yeah. no you're right what your mum is doing <laughs> with those pieces of uh, kitchenware whatever they are um is exactly what humans do they they come up with new meanings it's sometimes called repurposing technology or mm -hmm. uh coming up with a new use of a technology and that's very important in the process of innovation because it turns out that users just like your mum if they if she started a small company, imagine she starts some gizmo <laughs> that you know you all start using in your family. She thinks I'm going to set up a little company to market this. That often is how new innovations happen. Uh, the mountain bike came away, uh, 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 was developed that way. You know there was a uh, there were some people in California who wanted to ride their safety bicycles down hills, yeah. and they realized the safety bicycle wasn't so they modified it and it became the famously the mountain bike. Mm -hmm. Often in there are many examples in sporting technology, skating, skateboards, windsurfers. These are all things that people, users have said, hey, wouldn't it be cool? We had a little sail on a surfboard and you've got the windsurfer. So we're, people are doing this all the time in factories. Uh, historians of uh, industry have gone back and they've seen ordinary people who are often developing machines in factories that were really crucial for you know, making factories work better. Mm. Um, so it happens, I think you're right, this interpretive flexibility, this ability to reinterpret technology, everyone's got it, but only in certain circumstances. Mm. It, the story gets complicated because manufacturers don't always want you to do that. Because remember, we're in capitalism. Yes. And, um, you know, if, if everyone could develop their own technology mm. and you could open every black box and repurpose it to what you wanted to do, mm. they wouldn't be able to maybe sell so many machines. This happened famously um, with Henry Ford, mm -hmm. um, the old Model T motor car, mm -hmm. you know, developed in the 1930s. That car was used on farms for lots of things. It could be used as a stationary machine mm -hmm. for powering freshers or for a laundry machine. Mm -hmm. You could add huge tires and it could become a tractor. Mm -hmm. And Ford at first used to encourage this. He used to, people would develop kits to modify their Model T and Ford would encourage this until he had a product that he wanted to sell on top of the Model T, which was the Fordson tractor. So he had a separate tractor. He didn't want people adopting and, and using their Model Ts with big wheels as tractors. He wanted them to buy a new farm implement, a tractor. And so what he did, and we researched this, he said any, any car dealership selling these kits can't have the Ford dealership anymore. They can have other auto manufacturers, but they can't have the Ford one. And of course, the Ford one was the most important one. So he used his power in the market to constrain what users could do with technology. And we see that today, you know, with Apple is famous for it. You know, it's really hard to get inside your Apple iPhone and mm -hmm. turn it into a vinyl scratching MP <laughs> <and pee> player. <laughs> So I was just curious, since you brought that up, do you think uh, new technology uh, has created maybe a class divide in a way, you know, oh, I'm an Apple, uh, an owner of Apple products, and I know that it costs an arm and a leg, and you are an owner of, I, what brand cell phone do you have? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have an iPhone as well. <laughs> you know, daughter, I'm just saying. Dad, you got to get one, it's so much easier, so I got persuaded, but... <laughs> Yeah, but you're right. No, the, I mean, this is, we call this symbolism attached to technology. 
I mean, technology is part of your identity. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, what mobile device you have or whether you have one at all is part of your identity. And um, certainly, yeah, you know, you can convey a certain image of yourself, an identity of yourself by having a particular particular technological device. Of course, cars are famous for that, projecting mm. a certain image. Sure. And um, people can customize their technologies as well to convey other sorts of images. Mm. And so things of class are definitely tied up with technology. So in this social construction of technology, we're looking at things like gender, uh, race and class. Gender is interesting. Mm -hmm. I have people say, no, technology isn't gender, Professor, as my students say, mm -hmm. you know, they tend to think, you know, technology is kind of neutral. And then I say, take the barbecue as an example. Now, guys usually don't have much to do with cooking. That's changing, thank goodness. I did a little survey in class the other day and found that more kids and other boys could actually cook than ever before. So that how, how, I learned from my mother. So I've always learned, I know none how to cook. Mm -hmm. But you find guys who can't cook. When it comes to the barbecue, suddenly it's all about, you know, lifting the big gas thing, outdoors, manly activity, stoking up the coals, fire. So suddenly this, you know, domestic activity of cooking is repackaged because it's done outside. So it's not feminine anymore, it's masculine. It's, it's a real men are out there cooking this big chunks of meat. And uh, it's kind of interesting to think about it, but mm -hmm. you know, technologies are gendered as well. So do you um, think there are design characteristics that are important uh, in terms of marketing items for men or women or uh, a general group, neither men nor women? Certainly, um, skillful manufacturers are aware of that. Um, there's a, a study done in our field of shavers. Mm -hmm. And I noticed this because my, you know, I, I had two daughters, mm. and I can always tell their razor versus my razor, mm. you know, because their razors are marketed at the Venus razor, whatever it is, different shape, different color, you know. Well, I've got the Harry razor, even the name gives <laughs> it away, which are, you know, which is a different sort of razor. I mean, they they're basically doing the same thing. This so, is the bizarre thing. So, do you think these uh, product designers are in a way exercising Scott? and allowing us or uh, molding our culture for us because there's nowhere anywhere in history really that says that uh, women's razors must look like this or must be called this but it, uh, they're trying to make it appealing to us by reinforcing the idea that as women we go for that kind of stuff as men we go for that kind of stuff there's nothing in there which says men can't use venus razors yeah <laughs> Oh, I don't then... think they're getting it from Scott. I'd like, I'd be wealthy if they were. <laughs> uh, once I had one grad student, and he went to work for a, a, an entrepreneur, right. and he was Swiss. And he, the first email he sent me after his job in Switzerland, hey, professor, this dude has got your book on your on the shelf. This is the book about social construction of technology. I thought, ah, at last, some entrepreneurs reading it. But no, they, they know, I mean, people have been doing this for, you know, this is, Human, humans have been interacting with tools and machines forever. We've had capitalism a long, long time. Yeah. And so humans have worked out, you know, how to do this. And we're just studying it. And our job is to try and give human understanding to what these things that we've been doing for a long time. And, and I remember when we spoke uh, about a week ago, we came up with uh, several user types. And one of them was the conservative user. The one who, who won't change along with technology. Uh, I know a few people like that. Uh, they have a tool. The tool breaks down. Uh, the tool is 20 years old. They want to look for exactly the same tool. They can't find it, but they insist on it because they, re they, don't, they won't, don't want anything else but the old tool. Yeah, I'm like that. I'm old school. Word Perfect 4 was perfect for me. <laughs> Why did we have to have a change beyond Word I Perfect 4? I think we're all old school <laughs> in some way, right? We get comfortable with using things a certain way and we want the same thing. We don't see why we need to have other bells and whistles in our tool. We just want the same thing because we want to do the same thing with the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. Often technology moves so fast. And this is why synthesizers are so interesting because of the analog revival. And now, uh, as you know, because should we tell everybody out there that you and I played in the same, we jammed together? You and may. So, <laughs> yeah. We, well, I play in this band, Electric Golem, with Jim Spitznagel, and he's digital. I'm analog, I have these old Moog synthesizers. 
And Shirley did a concert with us and she was on Thurman. It was fantastic. We should get that band going again one day. Yeah, we should. You make it happen. I'll be there. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, but, you know, analog synthesizers have become cool again. They used to be very cheap. No one wanted them. They were in dumpsters and things. Mm. And in moving to you know, the next generation of synthesizers, eventually to digital, to MIDI, then software synths, mm. they missed things about the older technology. People didn't have time to explore the sounds in them. Yeah. And uh, there's a turn back to it now. And mm. some of the interfaces, of course, the analog interfaces, uh, are kind of, they're interesting in concert, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I've been with laptop musicians. It's not so exciting, you know, when they're sort of doing these little stuff on the laptop. Thurman's exciting because they can see what you're doing. Um, pitch bending's exciting when Keith Emerson, he showed me how to do this. Keith is a friend of mine, and, and, you know, the prog rock guy, Keith Emerson, Emerson Lake and Palmer. And when he pitch bend, he would exaggerate it with his elbow so the crowd could see what Keith Emerson was doing with his elbow. And, um, you know, those old interfaces, or now pitch wheels are on every synth, of course, it's, you need to call it a new, it was developed, though, for the Mini Moog originally in 1970. Mm -hmm. um, those old interfaces where people are doing stuff with wires and things, joysticks, mm -hmm. it's, it's aesthetically com compelling on stage. It looks exciting. I think that's one of the reasons people turn back to it, so the sort of yeah. gestures you can make with the instrument as well. Even then, the keyboard is laid out in such a way whereby unless you have a camera aimed at it, you know, from the top, it's really hard to see what the performer is doing if this performer is on stage. Yeah, exactly. And you can, you can use cameras. That's a good example. Craftwork, one of my favorite bands, would have cameras over so you could see who was soloing in Craftwork because their whole ethos was the, we are the robots, so they were doing minimal movements. But people still expected, they wanted to know Who's the solo? Who's doing the solo now in a Kraftwerk piece? And they put the video camera, it would switch to that one person of the four of them. Uh, so those, those cameras can add to it as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have user type number two for you. Uh, it's yeah. called the resistant user. The resistant user, <laughs> and I, yeah. And I, my definition is that these people, people have a fear for technology. Uh, or they are afraid of failing. They, that's one, I think that's one class, but there are resistors. The reason I'm hesitating is there are also resistors of technology who deliberately have tried it and they don't want to do it because they feel that it's going to do something that they don't want to do that's harmful for them. Um, ah. supposing, suppose you get a lot of, just a trivial example, if you get a lot of repetitive strain injury oh, from your yeah. keyboard, Mm. You might resist having another keyboard there, might think, you know, mm. do vo voice interaction or do more other sorts of gestures. Mm. Um, so I think you're right, there are there, there are definitely resistors, but you have to start thinking why people resist. And some some resistors are doing it for ideological posts. They just don't agree with the new technology that's come along. Mm. Um, some people, we had someone in our department at Cornell for years who didn't do email. That was pretty amazing. Oh, wow. But, yeah, the resistor, that's really old school. Wow. You know, you've got to be, but there are other people. Um, here, here's another example, John Chowning, mm. the guy who develops the DX7 synthesizer, the FM synthesis. Mm. Um, I've interviewed him and hung out with him in a few uh, music conferences and stuff like that, computer music conferences. Mm. And he famously doesn't do email. And mm. he, he can do it because he's, made a ton of, he's one of the few people to make some money in this field. Mm. He doesn't need to do it. Mm. Pu Putin doesn't do email. He has someone doing it for him. How did you, you know, know so, that? Ah, I got my contacts. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Read an article about it once. Oh, New really? Time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there are people <laughs> who resist to, you know, super wealthy as well as people who just don't want to do it. There's all sorts of interesting... I think we need more studies of resistors. This could be you. Yeah. You can go around studying people to resist technology. Okay. You're like on. people who resist the thermon. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sorry. I choked on my own saliva when I was about to reply to you. Uh, in fact, most people I know want to buy it. Whenever I perform, the, the most popular question is, where can I get one of those and how much is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you say go online, get the Bob Moog Thurman, build it in your own kit, 
what, 450 bucks. No one wants to know how much, uh, how long does it take to learn how to play one of those or who can teach me? <laughs> yeah, I bet, yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. They see it, they view it as though it were a toy or a gadget. Yeah. You know, not as a musical instrument. I th do you think it's because of the shape, its shape? The shape is non-traditional, so it's not viewed upon as an instrument in that traditional sense. It's just someone making noises who's doing it quite well, thank you very much, on a toy. So I want to yeah, know. No, I think it's very interesting because we were talking earlier about meanings of technology. Mm. And so then once you make an, a meaning of it's a toy or a gadget, toy in particular is kind of undervaluing it and saying it's not serious mm. it's for kids to use it's not a real competitor mm. and um i think that's a, a, again a meaning thing here's an example i was shocked when this happened um yeah. one of my favorite synthesizers is the vcs3 ah. which is the you know produced by ems in britain's yes. the british of london mm -hmm. it's marketed as the putney in america mm -hmm. so one of the pins Mm -hmm. in yes, and in, in fact, uh, one of my guests a uh, few streams ago worked uh, with them for a short while, and we covered uh, a little knowledge about it. Yeah, I wrote about it in my books, and I used to one of the first synths I played, so I know a ton about it. And you know, Pink Floyd used it for dogs. In, in fact, the Tristram Carey was my tutor uh, in Australia, and he was one of the developers of one the, of the three. Yeah. Tristram, yeah. He was at the Royal College of Music when I was a student in London many years ago, so I used to hang yeah. out there as well. All oh, right. But anyway, so I was telling, you know, I did this book on Bob Moog, and I was talking to Bob, yeah. and for me, the VCS3 is just like an incredible, because mm -hmm. they did it cheap. Yeah. The filter has got interesting properties and sounds. They, you know, it's, it's David Cockrell, the designer, did things cheaper than with the Moog, but it actually turned out to be very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was... You know, somehow I was waxing with Bob Moog about this, the VCS3 Bob, great. And he looked at me and he said, you take that thing seriously? That's just a toy. Wow. And yeah, I was really shocked. Yeah. And I think it was because he made this little joke about little uh, pins, you know, putting in the little patch pins. And so that mm. isn't, you know, real compared to a quarter inch jack wires into a, you know, a modular Moog. So it was sort of, you know, there again, you can see how meanings of things as toys can be constructed and technologies fail if they're not taken seriously. So if everyone mm. thinks that technology is a joke or a toy, it won't be taken seriously unless, of course, mm. it actually is a toy for kids and that's a big market. Do you think we're being snobs about what's a serious thing and what's a toy? Uh, uh, loosely say, uh, describing it, uh, a toy being something that, oh, this might not work, but let's say loosely saying a toy might be something that you put together with parts that you you, you find or you purchase yourself and uh, a serious uh, tool could be something you buy from a store. I'm not talking about toys as in what kids play. But no, rather, no, you know, well, I mean, toys are a mixed word because yeah. people like toys as well. And, uh, you know, I build a homemade synthesizer. I'm sorry, I play a homemade synthesizer. Yeah. And suddenly people, I don't think of it as a toy. You know, yeah. it's a serious contender. Mm. Um, so the fact it's made from a kit doesn't make it a toy. So I guess as you were saying earlier on, it depends mm. on the type of group that gives meaning to the same object. That's it. That's the theory. Yeah. Do I pass? <laughs> yeah. You've got an A. Straight to the top of the class, you leave. Yay. Yeah. yeah. Social construction of technology rules. Yay. <laughs> There's a guy actually in my field. It's funny because most people know synthesizers, but when we were developing in this world of academia, my other, well, my pay, my pay job, I can't make any money for music, obviously, none of us do, but my paid job is a professor. And I'm very well known for developing this theory. In fact, on Wikipedia, I think it's Dry Bridge Development Social Construction. Yeah, I Code. saw a huge page on you and uh, Professor Biker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we won prizes and all that stuff. And But one of the guys who developed it with us, is this French guy, Bruno Latour, and he's become really famous. I have to tell you this, he's probably one of the world's most famous philosophers at the moment. Ooh. And he used to hang out, used to sleep on my uh, on my couch when I was in Europe and uh, with mates actually, it's funny, now he's very famous of course. Um, and he was developing a very similar theory and mm. 
His theory is slightly different. It's called actor network theory. Uh -huh. And he's French. It's very French, but it's it's got a lot more complicated language than ours. Uh -huh. And because the joke is we think he's more successful because he's French, because the Brits try and explain everything clearly, while the French add another layer of mystified things. That's very yeah. unfair to Bruno because he's a, a brilliant guy. But it's a similar sort of theory. But um, but, but it could be called cultural mysticism. <laughs> <laughs> His great example is, I'll just tell you his example. He's always had nice examples. Is the what in England we call the sleeping policeman, but oh. in America you call the speed bump. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and he, he's interested in how human values and morals get written into technology. So there used to be, you know, a sign saying slow down. You don't need that sign anymore. You have a, a piece of technology, a speed bump, mm. that forces you to slow down. Mm -hmm. So it's the one piece of technology, the speed bump, is, in, is interacting with another piece of technology, your car, mm. and forcing you to slow down. So it's kind of like... Mm. Interacting technology. Yeah, interacting technology. Is exactly, that's his whole idea. Oh, so okay. technology studies is an interesting field. Yeah. <laughs> Trevor, I've got someone here uh, who's viewing the live stream, James Wells. Hi, James. And James is from Ithaca, New York. Do you Jim, know him? That's, oh, yeah. We've been in some sessions together. Yeah. Okay. Right. He, right. Wonderful. He's got a comment. Hi, Jim. Hey, Jim. Uh, he's got a comment I'd like to address, but before I do, Trevor, could you tilt your camera a bit more? You're slowly sinking down in your frame like this. <laughs> oh, you want it to go that way or that way? That, uh, stop. Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay. Stay there. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Me. So here is James's or Jim's comment. He says, I think the theremin can be considered a toy because it isn't touched, often used for sound effects and too easy to make sounds, even though it's very difficult to control. Hmm. What do you think, Trevor? Uh, um, well, it's easy to make sound. That's certainly true. I mean, people, every time they have, you must see this with your thermon. I've got a thermon as well. People just love to come up to it and they sort of wave their hands at it and they, oh, God, I can make sound. So Jim, so so Jim considers the theremin a toy. Remember we're talking about a toy or a, a proper instrument? Yeah. No, I mean, in it's because we, most people don't know how to play it. In the hands of you or Clara Rockmore, the theremin is not a toy. Clara Rockmore, as Jim knows, is probably the greatest virtuoso ever on the Thurman. And you look at those videos of her or the Thurman movie, her doing that vibrato, it's just mm. amazing. And uh, she she was a violinist and she mastered mm. that instrument to such a high level mm -hmm. that um, it's like you'd have to say, oh, a violin is a toy. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so. I think what, what's let the Thurman down is the society around it. Mm -hmm. That It's not the Thurman itself that um, we haven't yet, you know, be able to build a society where the thermos sort of fits in as what it should be. It's a fantastic instrument. Ah. So uh, I, I'm sorry, I need to apologize to Jim. He says, I don't consider it a toy, but uh, ah, I'm good. sorry. I didn't think he did. Yeah, because yeah, when I read it, it sounded like, because he says, uh, I think the theremin can be considered a, th a toy. Oh, all right. He says, all right, he, I'm pulling in his comment again. Uh, I'm just pointing out reactions I've seen. That says, uh, that's what Jim said. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's why I brought it up that, you mm. know, I've spent so many years and so much time uh, being able to utilize this as a musical instrument uh, mm. in an expressive way to make good music. Then yeah. it does it does irk me some when people consider it a toy, you know. And even using it for Hollywood, you know. Yeah. Why does that make it a toy? Hollywood's, you know, is it's produces tons of beautiful movies. Mm -hmm. It's great industry. Why why just because it's used in Hollywood does that make it a toy? No, mm -hmm. for me, that actually makes it even more serious. Mm-hmm. So I have a question for our viewers. Uh, I know some of you are hiding. There, please make yourself known. Say hello. Give us your name. Tell us where you're tuning Scared. in from. Don't hide, please. So I got a question for our viewers. How many of you rely on online reviews of a product before buying something? And how many of you actually pass on said review without trying out the tool first? You know, 
word of mouth. Oh, I read that it's not very good. I don't think you should buy it. <laughs> so, are you asking me, or are you asking your your uh, people viewers. out there? Viewers, yeah. Viewers. But because I may... wanted to study of online reviews, I can tell you a bit, bit about oh, this. Right? Please, yes. While we're waiting, um, yeah, um, it starts at Amazon, and um, there's a guy in the warehouse. Amazon used to, when it was a book company, uh, Jeff, when Jeff Bezos started it, used to employ these kind of literary editors, sort of like a literary website originally, the, oh, the website. Yeah. And he employed these literary editors who'd write fancy reviews of books for the website. Oh. And there was a guy, it was Gary, in the, web, in the warehouse. Yeah. One day, there was a possibility at the Amazon website that somebody, an employee, could post it. So he posted a review of one of the books that he'd been reading. Yeah. And they got the idea, hey, why don't we encourage everyone to do this? So they encourage Amazon employees to do it. And eventually they encourage readers to do it. And that's how the product review with Amazon was born. So it's Amazon that starts that. Although there's a history of it that goes back before online stuff with things like in Britain, we have the Automobile Association. In America, you have the AAA. In Britain, we have the AA and the Royal Automobile Club. We have two of them. One of them's with royalty, of course, endorsed by royalty. And they would go around writing books on hotels you could stay in, inns you could stay in, and bed and breakfasts. And they'd give them a certain number of stars. So you could buy this book that would, would say a two-star ranking, and they'd have experts who'd go around. It's rather like Michelin chef, you know, get the mm. stars. A Michelin star is done by an anonymous team of chefs going around. They do this with the AA. They go to hotels anonymously and give them a rating, one, two, three, or four stars, oh. and then put it in the travel guide. And this was, so this was before you know, online product reviews. So it actually started as an equivalent in the um, world of books and um, ah. travel, as it were. So but now, anyway, you can ask people when, I always read them. I think you should read them, online reviews. Don't read just one because there's lots of fake ones out there. But, you know, read a, read a bunch of them. I always do, why not? You can usually learn something from them. Again, reviews still are very subjective, which falls in line again with Scott. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's how the interpretation is built. How, how does this product? Do I get alive? Do I get five stars again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, you're going to get a royalty from the next Scott book, I can tell you. <laughs> so, anyone with uh, an answer to my query, have you ever read an online review and just assumed that that was accurate, uh, or that the review stopped you from buying something? Nobody so far. I got uh, a funny anecdote I wanted to share with you, Trevor, and everyone watching. Uh, mm. One of my friends, actually, a good friend of mine, Mick Spicer, Michael Spicer, probably knows this one, remembers this one, because we worked in the same multimedia company in Singapore. So it was many years ago, I headed marketing and I worked closely with technical support. So one day I was informed of a customer who was trying to install a driver by inserting a uh, two, three and a half inch floppies. And the flummoxed customer, the poor person had inserted one and I was desperately trying to insert the second one while the first one was still in the drive. <laughs> Not good. So it made me wonder because, of course, after that, I was given the task of writing user, uh, writing user manuals, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but you would imagine that Again, I guess I maybe I'm just expecting too much. Uh, I guess for someone who knew that the floppy drive only allowed for one disk at a time, that's why there's the eject button. Mm. I guess I shouldn't assume that everyone realized that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, those little n nuances of design are really important, as you know. Um, do people realize there's an eject button? How, how do you um, how do you interact with a computer? You know, uh, mm. it's very interesting if you think about interfaces of interacting with computers. We humans are really conservative. Um, the keyboard on a, on my computer here, Q W E R T Y, QWERTY mm. keyboard, is taken over from the typewriter. So that's like from the 19th century. We haven't improved the keyboard since then. Mm. Or if we have improved it, people don't want to take, they're very conservative. They don't want to have a different keyboard because they've learned this keyboard. 
there are alternative keyboards. Do you, do you think the education system is to be blamed as well? Because, you know, a lot of schools have uh, typing classes and to change the way things have always been, the change has to start from somewhere. But if the schools insist on teaching the same old, same old, there's no reason to change. Yeah. Well, um, education is obviously very important. The The story is the history of the, of the typewriter is that I think it's Underwood developed the QWERTY keyboard and they developed typing schools. And that became, the, the, there were alternative typewriters, but the Underwood QWERTY keyboard takes off because of typing schools. So you're exactly right. Back then, when these were typing schools for secretaries, mm -hmm. they learned to type, and that became the predominant interface. But just as to amplify, if you go to the computer, um, what else has we had since then? We've got the mouse. Douglas Engelbart designs the mouse at Stanford, mm -hmm. and that's basically a, you know, it was based originally on a piano design. It had several keys, mm -hmm. so it was a, uh, it was like a musical keyboard. Mm -hmm. The first mouse. If you go to the uh, Smithsonian History Museum, you'll see there's an exhibit there. It had five five keys and eventually becomes simplified to the mouse that we know today. Mm -hmm. But that's a major invention, the mouse, mm -hmm. because we have the keyboard and the mouse. That's all that is interacting on my laptop or now the swipe gesture. Oh, we have the trackpad, though. Yeah, the trackpad, and <laughs> which is kind of linked to the mouse. and the. But, I mean, it's very, very few ways of interacting. That's true. You think about it. I guess the swipe could be the most dom uh, 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 I, it could be one of the more major inventions, you know, because mm. uh, yeah. it, it well, seems the to be iPhone, the, the, the the swiping gesture on your iPhone has been really crucial. I think. Yeah, you know, you can even on the trackpad, uh, one finger, three fingers, four fingers, yeah. right or left, up or down. It's kind of the major gesture now. The mouse yeah. is kind of more I don't like... know much about the history of the, the trackpad. That's interesting. Yeah, mm. you should study it. Surely yeah. you're studying. Oh, no. OK, yeah. I'm enrolling. <laughs> <laughs> no. So a friend of mine, uh, Linda, who is Michael's wife, she says she reads a bunch of reviews. Yeah, yeah. In response to my uh, querying our viewers, if they read reviews before she buying does, a good. product, yeah, yeah, she reads a bunch of them. Oh, J uh, think... Jim as well. He says I do read reviews. Hard to get hands on equipment first. YouTube demos can be very helpful, especially if I don't agree with the reviewer. That's true. I do like YouTube uh, review or, or YouTube demos. And in mm. fact, I watch a lot of YouTube demos before I buy anything. In fact, I've, I've, some, yeah. I've yeah. made a few YouTube demos on on products that have come out because I thought, oh, I know this stuff. Maybe I should do some demos yeah. for yeah. people. <laughs> Uh, Jim also said uh, that's personal taste and understanding how I would use it compared to how the reviewer would use it, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I have more questions for you, Trevor. Of course, you know, I was in marketing, so a lot of these questions kind of come from the, the marketing reference. Mm. I'm curious. Color. Color in technology. We've always seen uh, grays and blacks and silvers, but synthesizers in the last few years have been painted all kinds of jewel colors, purple, emerald green, sea mm. blue, yellow. Mm. You would assume that synthesizers are predominantly a male type thing, you know, speaking mm. of uh, gender labeling or gender marketing. Do you think this is subliminal coercion? Uh, do you think they are trying, uh, the product designers are trying to approach, uh, entice women into the fold or? By using or different colors. Yes. I, I, I don't know enough about modern synthesizer design to really get answer authoritatively. I did um, a review uh, the only modern synthesizer I reviewed recently is not that modern, is the Teenage Engineering, uh -huh. OP, whatever it is, OP1, OP2, 
synth, which is beautiful in terms of colors. It's got some nice colors on it, fantastic sequences. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were appealing more, I felt, to kind of the, how can you put it, the gaming world. Ah. Uh, people who are used to stuff from gaming. And mm. um, I don't know. I mean, how synth is going back to the period I really know about, the Moog period, mm. um, the walnut Moog finish makes no difference to the sound, but it was very important aesthetically. Mm. The fact that Mini Moog was so well finished mm. in walnut, and even the, when they did the, the Voyager, you know, the digital yeah. version, that it was still with that beautiful wood. Um, and I think, so I think the aesthetics are things that don't, aren't functional to the synthesizer and sense of the wood really and the color probably do matter in terms of how people perceive the instrument. Do you think and, it's a Moog thing? Because the E-Pro uh, was fashioned out of uh, maple, maple wood or maple laminate. I'm mm. not sure, but it's maple anyway. That's what they told me. Mm. But I yeah, don't know. Yeah, not usually, but um, this was maple. I'm quite sure it's maple. Yeah. Um, I think. Let me see quickly. E Pro. Maple. Mm. You might be right. I have a I have a beautiful pink uh, synthesizer, an old one, a Korg, and um, I like that one. <laughs> so pink is for boys as well. Well, uh, pink and blue was really a 1940s marketing construct, so I found like, out. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, in fact, it used to be the reverse, pink for boys and blue for girls. Oh, kind really? Of, yeah, 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 kind of like the little black dress. There was never such a thing about the, bl- you know, the colors to a funeral or colors to a wedding or so on and so forth. But yeah, some some clever marketeers or fashion designers decided to to make it so and everyone just followed. So right. I guess the users who are followers. Yeah. Color, I mean, another thing, just the v- going back to the VCS3, um, synthesizer had these beautiful colored knobs. You know, that uh, Peter Zanovia, the manufacturer, the guy who developed those synths, basically had this idea that it should be a, his whole studio was beautiful aesthetic. His, you know, his, his large studio where he did his recording mm. it was beautiful. It was more like an upper class salon, mm. the, you know, your regular recording studio. Mm. And that was his whole aesthetic. So mm. the VCS3 had these beautiful, had beautiful knobs really wonderful, you can grab them and turn them beautifully. And they were all colored, different colors, I remember. And that was appealing, just a little thing like that. Mm. Uh, So (laughs) Moog used to say that they put so much attention on knobs. Knobs were one of the most important part of a synthesizer because you're interacting mainly with the knob Mm. and on a darkened stage, Mm. you wanna be able to on that mini Moog reach the right knob, not screw it up and it's gotta respond well. So I'm not, you know, colors, knobs, the wood, the textures, I think all these things, mm. the layout, are very, very important in synthesizer design. Mm. Um, Speaking of synthesizer, I'm sorry, I didn't no. mean to interrupt. No. Oh, so speaking of synthesizer design and traditional and non-traditional shapes, uh, have you heard of the MPE uh multi polyphonic expressive controllers such as the Haken Continuum. We're gonna have the guys from Haken Continuum as guests. I didn't know that from you because you said oh. you're having the Haken Continuum. Said, What's a Haken Continuum? So I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the so the Haken Continuum is one of uh, in the group of instruments known as the uh, multi polyphonic expressive controllers, where the player gets independent control of uh, an array of sound parameters, but uh, each finger gets the independent control of all these parameters. Unlike the I don't way. Know. Yeah. I'm not enough of a keyboardist to know, surely, because you know, when 
we're using the mini Moog. We're using it as a source of sound. Mm. So David Borden showed me this trick. You know, David Borden mm. was in Mother Mallard, who was Moog's first studio band. Mm -hmm. And they would do this as well. The trumpet piece, the mouthpiece of the trumpet, mm -hmm. is the perfect weight and size to put on a key. You just put that one key down, it's monophonic, and that key will be your source of sound that you can mess with the other bits. Oh, um, that's, so that's smart. <laughs> <laughs> little tip. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, um, so I'm not, a, I'm not you, like you, you're a keyboard player. And um, I don't know, uh, I mean, Bob struggled for ages to make a touch-sensitive keyboard. Mm. You have to remember one of the most expressive pieces of synthesizer music, Wendy Carlos's Switched On Bark, mm -hmm. was done without touch sensitivity. Mm. And everyone agrees that that's the most live, wonderful, in that period, piece of music. And even when she did it digitally later with touch-sensitive keyboards, it didn't sound as live. And so I'm a... You know, I've seen these amazing keyboards, this this red one that you can program any way and it sort of floats around. Mm. And I'm always reminded of what Brian Eno used to say, that mm. constraint is a good thing. And that if you have too much, we have too much freedom, we kind of get paralyzed by it. And so sometimes, mm. you know, if you think it, go back to Wendy Carlos working with the modular Moog in 68, producing that genius piece of music, it was so constrained what you could do. But so I'm actually a believer that sometimes there's too much freedom, too many wonderful gizmos. And that if you're constrained with just a few things and explore that, that you can be more creative that way. Hmm. It's just my own aesthetic. <clears throat> That's a good one. I guess, again, it, it falls back on the, uh, the theory that everyone finds a different meaning from what they see and do or the tool, what they, they use the tool for. And... I guess constraint is always good. It's kind of like discipline, you know, spoil the child kind of thing. I know, spare the rot and spoil the child if you don't give them some discipline. I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to spank your kid. I'm saying, you know, using yeah, that as an example. Yeah, not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that uh, uh, when you have constraints, uh, the mind has to then come up, be, uh, come up with ideas to make something happen un within those constraints. So that's where your interpretive flexibility kind of comes into play in that area. And some yeah. people might see that, oh, this MPE controller fits the bill precisely and that's what I want to use it for and um, mm -hmm. finds meaning in using that tool. So going back to the history of technology, yeah. we actually use the, the word we don't use so much as constraint is closure. Closure. So mm -hmm. interpretive flexibility implies openness in design. Mm -hmm. Closure is the opposite. And technology seems to proceed with moments of openness and then moments of stability or closure. And you seem to need these moments of closure because that enables, if everything was changing all the time, mm -hmm. it became a pretty impossible world. Yeah. So you need things to be stable as well. I mean, I'm glad that my keyboard isn't morphing all the time when I come to <laughs> you know, use my laptop in the morning. I'm glad that the QWERTY still is working pretty much the same. I so, have I have that problem with a the theremin. Whenever every morning I wake up, it's morphed some some way, some shape or form. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the trouble because of analog synths. You set up a sound the previous night, go the next morning to the studio, and it's gone. <laughs> Something go? else. I thought this was a really great sound. It sounds terrible today. Because <laughs> yeah. that's why you need your tape recorder to tape record immediately. That's true. Well, yeah. yeah. So you then. brought up this closure thing. I see here there's another uh, label or another term following that equation that's wider adoption and unattended effects. Hmm. Uh, well, un unanticipated or unintended effects are very important. Um, stuff um, happens, basically. You can't, uh, designers think you can control something and, you know, who would have thought, you know, think of Edison designing the phonograph and first the wax cylinders, then, you know, the, the shellac vinyl flat disc. And then you have DJ theatre coming along in the Bronx, you know, a century later, messing with his um, stylus or needle on the record, making the first scratch sound. Thinks, God, that's super cool. And there's a whole new musical instrument for DJs, scratching. And uh, 
It's an unintended consequence. No one thought of that in advance. Mm. And we don't know what potentialities there are in technology till you actually use this experiment with them. No one could have predicted. Edison couldn't see the scratch coming along. Um, many unintended uses of technology, by their definition, are not planned. And um, sometimes they can be unfortunate and no good, but other times they can be creative and useful. Mm. So that's another thing to think about, I think. And in, you know, we're not living in a pre-planned world. We're living in a world of contingency. We often have to face you know, dealing with unforeseen things, accidents. And turning those accidents into creative moments, I think, is part of the skill. Wow, that's pretty profound. I'm going to pause for a moment. <laughs> Do you take adver advertising break now or something? <laughs> I wish there were <laughs> advertisers, but that's yeah. pretty profound. And I like profound. Anyone have any comments or questions for Trevor? You know, there are a few more people hiding that I can see how many are viewing, but they don't want to acknowledge their presence by telling us their names or where they're tuning well, in on the live chat. But then, now they just like to lurk and watch lurk. And that often. <laughs> they're, they're so shy. Actually, mm. I'm shy too. Mm. No questions, yeah. no comments. Trevor, is there more you want to say about Scott? Um, no, I think we've covered, uh, uh, we get some good examples and you ask some good questions. Um, it's, um, it's an evolving theory. It's, uh, you know, what I love about it is that students often come up with modifications to it and new ways of thinking and adding bits to it over time, mm. which makes it interesting. Um, and it does, it, I was proud that I could use it in the, History of the synthesizer. I thought, oh, mm -hmm. this is a field I'm passionate about, and I play stuff in. And if I can bring this theory alive in my own, and it's it just sort of worked for this whole Mo Bukla story. I, I, and then later circuit bending again. I've been studying circuit bending. You know, yes, that's that hardware hacking circuit bending where mm -hmm. people take a toy. These are toys, an electronic toy, and adapt it for useful musical sounds strange sounds, often bizarre sounds, mm -hmm. they'll wire a little potentiometer or a switch, mm -hmm. then use it in musical performance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Again, that's another opening up of technology. Mm. Uh, so speaking of opening up technology and circuit bending, what do you think of AI and machine uh, learning in, uh, involved in this whole Scott thing? Well, um, it's not involved in Scott, but I have experience of AI and uh, thought a lot about it. Oh, it's not involved, <laughs> it's so good. I have a collaboration. Yeah. This might be interesting to the people watching okay. your channel. Uh, have a, uh, Cornell has a, a, a campus in New York City called Cornell Tech, many computer scientists. And I was down there for six months. And uh, it was a funny story being down there because they saw me as a humanist, not a technology person oh really you know, music they, they didn't know what to, to do with me they gave was, you their own meaning <laughs> yeah I, and i was in the most marginal position i was by you know we we're in the google building in chelsea and they you know this is the tech industry they all work on these big desks you don't have your own office you have a desk you know it's a big long thing and they gave me a space the most junior space with all the students who are programming security apps by the coffee machine. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And, um, but then eventually I, I met a guy there who um, I discovered did artificial intelligence, deep learning on recognition of birds. And he'd worked oh. for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and developed programs with deep learning so that your little, you know, eventually your little small device, you'd see a bird and it would recognize the bird. Yeah. And um, it's like sh sh Shazam for birds. <laughs> <laughs> is Shazam cool. still around? Yeah, I think it so. Is, I don't know. Um, so imagine Shazam for birds. And this guy, I started collaborating. His name was Serge Belanger, great name. And he used to be, he used to be um, a bassist in a rock band in LA mm. for several years. And he wow. ended up being a computer scientist. So we, we really hit it off, mm. became sort of pals. 
So I came up with this idea. I said, wouldn't be thinking of Shazam, thinking of what you've done with this bird thing. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't it be cool if we had an app that when you went to a concert, mm-hmm. you could hold it up and it would recognize all the gear on stage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it would be, is that a telecast or a stratocast? Because we know that. Mm-hmm. Is that, you know, is that, what is that? Headphones. Imagine this, you imagine you're, you know, you're, a D, you're into DJing and what's those D, that headphones that DJ is using? What's that amp over there? Oh, that guy's got a cool saxophone. What is that saxophone? You just hold it up and it would identify the gear. Mm. So that became our project. Mm. So to use deep learning to recognize musical instruments. Now I learned two interesting things from that. One is I thought we'd be able to do it by the sound of the instrument, but it turns out to be way too difficult. Visual is much easier because sound is corrupted by, especially in that we want to do it for live performance. So you can go to a concert and do this. Sound is corrupted by going into mixers and you know amplifiers and the, the sound you produce in the guitar may not be the sound that comes out of the amp once it's gone through for pedals and so on. Mm-hmm. So we thought, let's do it visually. And we, we actually trained it up to um, recognize guitars. And uh, we had this uh, demo video of Ed Shearer, of all people, and he'd be playing different guitars, and it would show the, you know, label them. It would, it, it was a while before the computer could recognize the guitar from the human. Mm. By the way, you can never do headphones because DJs have too much hair. Oh. They would always confuse big hair with headphones. So we couldn't do headphones. Got it. Um, but what I learned about that is that the when they talk in AI and deep learning, the data set is the key thing. Mm. So they train the neural net, as it's known, mm-hmm. with data. And they need you need labeled data. So you need lots and lots of images. Say, so suppose you want it to recognize a, a telecast. You need lots and lots of images of telecast that's being used live mm. and labeled so that everyone knows it really is a telecaster. Mm-hmm. And you need that for every instrument. So that, um, what I found about um, AI was that it's actually in getting that data that's the big bottleneck in AI. Mm. Because in some sense, the programming work has already been done. Mm. They've already learned how to program to do this. And they know how to move it to a small device. There's a technical way of doing that. Mm. But what they're not very good at is compiling those huge data sets. So this is why data, you know, the data you can get from, say, social media and so on is so crucial. Mm-hmm. And Have you heard of the AI composer? It, uh, no, it's a, uh, uh, but I've heard of lots of other computer gizmos that are supposed to make great music and never do, but. <laughs> Have you heard an example? I've heard them from other computers. This goes back along. Peter Zinovia, the guy who invents the VCS3, has a concert in Queen Elizabeth Hall in 1967 Jeez. where he's got a computer playing a piece of music on stage. So it goes back a long way, computer music. I saw one recently uh, and I heard the little clip briefly and it's quite good. I, uh, I don't recall the names, but it was an AI uh, system involved in identifying and then uh, writing a pop song. Mm. Quite good. Yeah, yeah. Those things that they can be good at lyrics as well. I was a a, um, a hackathon they called it. Yeah, at MIT, and one of the the groups in the hackathon had developed some software for writing lines of songs, mm. and they were just taking you know lines from Dylan songs and scrambling them up, and it's sort of like writing poetry. And it's pretty amazing what comes out. Mm. You know, it can fool you for a while. Um, mm. Yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> it's a brave new world out there. Yeah, I was just curious yeah. what you thought. Yeah, there's a lot of hype about AI. Uh, here's something interesting. I have a colleague at Cornell, Ron Klein, mm. who's a historian of technology. And most areas of technology have been really well studied. Artificial intelligence, the history of it, has been hardly written about at all. Mm. It's a field that's dominated by hype and philosophers talking about it. Mm. And we don't actually know that much about how these systems developed, what the debates in the field were, mm. what the fights were, who had the resources. And um, 
it's amazing in a way that such a hyped up field, everyone knows about AI you know, as a buzzword. Mm. There's very few critical deep studies of the history of that field, how it evolves, what their struggles are. And he's writing a book on it. It's one of the few people to do that. Mm. It's interesting to think that because we all think everything's kind of well known. AI must be well known, must know everything about that. But no, the actual history of, the, of this subject has moved so fast, isn't very well known. Mm. Anyone in our viewers uh, can shed some light on AI? Because uh, it's applied in their work. Uh, is anyone working with AI? Just thought I'd ask. <clears throat> I see Sam, uh, a friend of mine from Sydney, Australia. Hi, Sam. You just tuned in, I guess. You know, on my Facebook event, somehow and, or rather, even though I picked location as Nashville, Tennessee, which should be central time, uh, it seems to think that I, I started broadcasting an hour later, so I don't understand why. So I hope no one's going to arrive now. <laughs> hey, Shirley, why don't we, one way uh, of closing would be, when I said at the beginning, yeah. uh, can I tell you a story about how we met, dear yes. viewers? Yes. You thought you, I meant, how did I meet Viva Baker? I actually meant, how did I meet you? Oh, no, yeah, yes, go on, <laughs> tell a story. Yeah, because it's kind of funny. It because is? most people probably don't know that there was a Moog Fest in New York City, a much smaller one than the big electronic dance music thing in Nashville. And this was for real Moog heads. And Bob Moog himself used to show up. And people like me who wrote books about Moog would show up. And it was held in B.B. King's Club in Times Square, New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to the first ever Moog, and this may have been the first one, I can't remember if it was the first one or the second one. And uh, the promoter, Charles Collini, had a stack of my books there to promote because he thought he's got a book on Moog, let's promote them at Moogfest. And it's never happened to me before in my life. Mm -hmm. But I arrived at Moogfest and there was this glamorous model sitting beside a pile of my books. Can you remember this? And uh, yes. I, I said to Kalini, why have you hired? Because, you know, I'm an academic. We're not used to doing <laughs> uh, And, and um, I said, what's she doing there? And he said, oh, we hired her because it's Rick Wakeman's birthday. And she's going to be in a birthday cake on stage. And he's, he's going to come out and surprise Wick, we, Rick. And we didn't know what to do with her the rest of the, the, the evening. So she's, we thought she could promote your book, Trevor. <laughs> and I always remember this because we sold every book we had. And mm. Moogfest, you know, it was this strange combination of sort of geeky guys, because Keith Emerson was playing, guys in leather jackets, all weird, many guys, a lot of guys there, drunk. And they sort of stagger over to see who's this model, mate. You know, they sort of stagger over. And then they see this book, and they say, there's a book on the Moog synthesizer. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'd sell it to them. We sold every copy. And you were there on stage performing. That's how we met, right? Mm -hmm. What was the band you were with? And it was my band, Xenovibes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I thought I'd give you a chance to say what it is. Yeah. And you gave me a book. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for those of you who are not sure about the book we're talking about, I have a picture of it. So hold on, Trevor. I'm going to show it. So here's mm. a picture of Analog Days, the invention and impact of the Monk synthesizer. Trevor mm. Pinch and Frank Trocco. Did I get his name right? Frank Trocco is absolutely right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were fun, those small Moog Fests, weren't they? I, I regret it got so big. It was nice in B.B. King's Club. Yeah, it was. I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still friends with uh, Charles Carlini on LinkedIn. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, he was. You know what happened at the second Moog Fest, the next one I went to? No. Um, the DJ on stage oh. was a New York radio DJ, and he was double booked. Oh. And um, halfway through, was, you know, the comp here, halfway through, he had to leave to go to another gig. Oh. So Carlini said, Trevor, you're a lecturer at university. You can be the comp here. <laughs> so suddenly I had to do this role <laughs> of the MC on stage. And it was so funny because I didn't know anything. I didn't know who the bands were. They were sort of Jordan Rudis is playing. You know, he's got a big concert in Central. His manager would be there. Say this, he's got a big concert in Central Park coming up. Uh, I knew something about the synths. 
<laughs> who were playing. So I got introduced. Uh, who, who was playing at that? Edgar Winter, oh. Frankenstein. Edgar Winter was playing. Wow. And I, I, at least I knew he played an art synthesizer. <laughs> so this was a strange as an academic ending up as an MC on B.B. King's Club for Moogfest. But you were a natural, though, Trevor. Well, I don't know about that, but it was it, it was fun. It was a strange thing to do my academic career. But I was really scared because I didn't <laughs> not be a, an MC. I didn't. Jordan Rudis is like this famous guy, and I, I'm going to get this wrong. I don't know what his latest record is. or. <laughs> You're funny. So we got a reply from Sam uh, from Sydney, Australia, when I asked everyone uh, if anyone worked uh, in the uh, used AI in their work, and so Sam replied with, "Yes, cybersecurity in Australia." Ah, cybersecurity. Sam. Yeah. yeah. I want to pick his brains now. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder what cybersecurity is. That's using artificial intelligence in what way? I wonder. Yes, to Sam. stop people, stop people breaking into uh, other people's websites and things like that must be possibly. Sam, could you give us a quick summary of how you apply AI in cybersecurity, what its role is? So I'll wait for you to reply. Mm. Any more stories, Trevor? Ah, oh, well, no, that's how we met. I just thought people might be interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought you meant you and uh, Professor Biker. That's really, I just assume, but thank you so much. Because uh, it's an often asked question from the viewers. They want to know how I met my guests, but I just never thought of asking you. But you thought yeah. of it instead. Yeah. There you go. I should be having my own show, surely. <laughs> yeah, you should. Now, life's too busy already. <laughs> So I do you're, have... you're good at it. I, I, I don't think I could. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of patience as well. Yeah, I've learned how to have patience. Patience is not something I wish on anybody because mm. uh, if, you, if you wish for patience and you get it, you'd be tested in so many ways. <laughs> oh, is that right? And uh. you realize you're not patient after all. <laughs> mm. Ah, okay. That sounds <laughs> profound as well. All the... Your viewers should pause on that thought. Yeah, pause on that thought. But uh, uh, I think uh, asking for, wishing for uh, being able to stay calm is mm. more useful than patient. Because mm. mm. when you're calm, under stressful situations, you can stay, still think clearly and get things done. Mm. Mm. Whether, yeah. you have, whether you have patience or not. <laughs> now let's pause <laughs> <laughs> Sam we're still waiting here from you but I do have a question for Trevor um, if new technology so I wrote here here's a good question and this is how I phrased it if new technology is determined to create change in our culture how important is the study of Scott and where should it begin if new if new technologies cause change in our culture, it's determined to change, create change in our culture. Determined, you see, um, the phrase I'm not liking or the word I'm not liking. Good, you may change it. Is it? Yeah, it's determined, because according to social construction technology, we try and we're fighting all positions in academia have a sort of another position they're fighting against usually. The old bad wrong position. Yeah. In our case, it's technological determinism. Got it. And this is the view that technology has a determinate outcome on society. It's kind of fixed how it impacts society. And we're saying now there's much more because of this interpretive flexibility. There's much more choice. And um, humans are more creative than we think. And it's usually not. It's very rare. There's one determined outcome. So I don't know if your question has been provocative, but if you're saying social construction technology has a determined outcome in the future, I'd say no. It, it depends on how users and how we as humans interpret things and take things in different directions. So that's good advice for people who are fearful of uh, adopting new technology, I guess, in a way. I know several people who don't 
want change because they're afraid of change. Uh, and unfortunately, if I may use the word technology loosely, we will encounter more and more technology, whether it's silicon chips or not, but anything that's a tool or an enabler, anything that allows us to do something, assists us in accomplishing something we couldn't do otherwise on our own, uh, it's going to be there whether you like it or not. So don't be afraid. Well, you don't have to. That's a very passive voice for humans and their role in technology, like it or not. I mean, I think <laughs> there's another way of thinking about it. Try this. Okay. But once you realize that technology depends upon human roots and social groups, as I've tried to argue, mm -hmm. it puts the humans more in control. So nothing's inevitable in technology. We humans are actually shaping the technology we have. And there's nothing inevitable, say, take social media. You know, there's nothing inevitable that we have to have more and more social media systems. It seems like that. But once you realize that the humans constructing technologies and play a role in it, maybe we can get some of the power back from Silicon Valley. And, um, you know, ordinary users of technology can start to play more of a role. That would be my dream. But, you know, because at the moment it just seems so sort of inevitable. It's mm. capitalism. So mm. few designers in Silicon Valley who control things, few companies. And once you realize that, in fact, the whole thing depends upon a mass of ordinary users as well. And what we do is more chance to democratize technology, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's the thought I'd like everyone to take yeah, away. Yeah, that's with a good yeah. thought. Yeah. And I'd we like to add. Technology. Yeah, and I also like to add to those people. I notice again hanging out around my, uh, hanging out with my mom and her friends that uh, they forget that technology isn't like an overlord. Like a what? An uh, overlord. Overlord. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no. Technology so, was designed by human beings. And there, in fact, as you mentioned your mom and her friends redesigning technology. They're, it's very much the opposite. You know, they're ordinary people messing with technology, coming up with new ideas for it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, I think that's kind of liberating and empowering to think of that. I think so. Thanks, yeah. Trevor. So maybe that, Sorry, yeah. go on. I said maybe that's a good note to end on. Yes, I think so. Sam is not forthcoming with an answer, so I'm going to say thank, let's thank Trevor Pinch for his time and his insight into Scott. Uh, Trevor, thanks so much for spending time with us. I know it's getting late for you on the East Coast, 9.30. It's not too late, yeah, but... It's almost bedtime, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I have a little... Well, thank you for having me. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. And um, uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings or mornings, wherever you are. That's and an applause for Trevor, and Trevor's got a You're Awesome uh, animated GIF as well. Trevor, you're the best. It was great to see you and talk to you, and uh, I'll catch up with you soon, I hope, somehow. Yeah. Let me know when you're going to start this band. Okay, we'll do, Shirley. Okay. Okay, take care, Trevor. Bye, see bye. Ya. Enjoy. Bye. See ya. bye. Okay, so thanks everyone uh, for trying to um, add some excitement in today's live stream. It was such a great thing to have Trevor. Uh, he's always got so much to talk about and always a great fodder for um, understanding uh, new thoughts and uh, new devices. So my guest next week is the duo of engineer Lipol Haken and sound uh, designer Edmund Egan, who built together the Haken Continuum and the sound uh, synthesis engine Egan Matrix. I think you'll have great fun chatting with them. They built the uh, instrument that I tried to describe earlier on. It's uh, a, a multi polyphonic expressive controller with a surface that resembles the layout of a keyboard.
but does not work at all like a keyboard. So I hope to see you next week. Do subscribe to my channel, select notification to be alerted of when and what time I am streaming. Uh, pass the word around please and say a few kind words that I may quote to promote the broadcast. Have a great week. Take care everyone and stay safe and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.